left it short for me. That's very nice. Um, so we're going to get started. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call our program to order. My name is Michelle Ackerman, and I'm a consultant for the Kilmer Group and chair of ULI Toronto. It's wonderful to see everyone here this evening, and we're so pleased for such a huge turnout, even though it snowed. I know that was, I think, very shocking for everybody, but really happy that you're here. Uh, I welcome you on behalf of two organizations tonight, ULI Toronto and the University of Toronto School of Cities, who we are pleased to co-host with once again. Our event this evening is in partnership with and produced by CBC Toronto. Of note, our last collaboration with CBC Toronto also featured Olivia Chow, who at that time was candidate Olivia Chow, not yet Mayor Olivia Chow. That event was the final media candidates debate. Eight months later, here we are, we're happy to have the opportunity to bring the band back together. As always, we begin with the land acknowledgement. As a Toronto region-based organization, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, and newcomers in this generation or generations past. Tonight's events and all other ULI programming would not be possible without the support of ULI's annual sponsors. Now more than ever, ULI Toronto relies on the support of sponsors to put on high quality programs and to drive our mission to shape the future of built environments for transformative impact and communities worldwide. This evening's event was made possible by the generous support of our event sponsors, who I would also like to thank. Tonight's presenting sponsor is Madame e. Holmes. We will soon hear from Neil Haggart, President, GTA Urban Division, Madame e. Holmes, who will introduce this evening's special guests. Tricon Residential is tonight's lead sponsor, and I know that Tobias Orwell, SVP, is on deck to thank our speakers and close out our program tonight. We also thank Atrium Mortgage Investment Corporation, the Carpenters Union, Civic Developments, and Windmill, who round out our event sponsors. We also want to acknowledge the generosity of BDP Quadrangle, who have covered the registrations for over 25 of our Kirtner Urban Leadership Program mid-career cohort this evening. To all of our sponsors and supporters, we say thank you. <laughs> Lastly, to finish up my remarks, I want to flag one very important program that is on the ULI calendar. Please join ULI Toronto and our venue sponsor, RBC, for our third ESG Symposium on Friday, March 1st. This impactful, educational, and yes, fun program should be a can't-miss event for every company doing business in the Toronto region. It is now my pleasure to introduce Neil Haggart, President, GTA Urban Division, Madame Holmes, to introduce our featured guests. Neil. Michelle, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today, to, and it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces in the audience, and everybody important to talk about such an incredibly important issue that's so relevant to us all today, housing. And in particular, the need to build more homes faster. The fact is we need more type of homes, from rental options, to condominium townhomes, to detached homes, and we need them now. And to make this happen, we must come together as partners, industry, all levels of government, civic leaders, and fellow neighbors. So I've spent my career in housing, close to 30 years in fact, you can see it in the gray hair. I don't think I've seen such an intense focus on such an important issue that we are right now. Actually, I think we're in a, in a moment of consensus, and I think together we can seize that consensus. So in my role, I'm responsible for expanding and enhancing Madame's high-rise and mid-rise presence in the greater Toronto area. Now, while Madame Homes has been building for over 45 years, the Madame name isn't quite synonymous with housing in the city of Toronto, to be honest. So that's about to change. Today, we have more than 5,000 high-rise units under development that will be brought to the market within the next few years, all in transit-centric locations 
all in the city of Toronto. And that's just the starting point. We have another 5,000 units planned on future lands. So suffice it to say, Mattamy has aspirational goals to become a trusted housing provider here in the city. We're also focused on the future of our industry, a future that needs to be more sustainable. And that's why we're working to lower our carbon footprint of our homes and our building practices. It's the kind of forward-looking change that we are committed to as each year we help more than 4,000 homes across Canada, 4,000 families across Canada realize the dream of home ownership. So builders like Mattamy and others are the engine that drive housing growth. But such a production requires a solid partnership where we align our interests to achieve a shared goal, more housing options in Toronto for now and for generations to come. And that's why I'm so happy to welcome our speaker, Her Worship Olivia Chow, Mayor of Toronto. Olivia Chow is the 66th Mayor of Toronto and the first woman to serve, the role, serve in the role since the six municipalities of Metro Toronto were amalgamated back in 1998. Mayor Chow has been leading an important conversation about the full spectrum of housing needs across this vast city. We've seen that Mayor Chow is a consensus builder, and I look forward to hearing more about how the City of Toronto and developers can work together to create that much needed housing. I'd also like to introduce David Common. Uh, he, will, he is the host of Metro Morning on CBC's Radio One and CBC Listen, uh, and David is a contributor to lots of other CBC news programs. Mayor Chow is going to begin tonight's program and be, with, with some remarks that will be followed by a conversation with David. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Chow. Good evening. Thank you for making it, even if the weather out there is uh, not uh, the best, but thank you for being here. You and I know that people in our city are finding it harder than ever to find a home that they can afford. The waiting list for affordable housing is, oh, balloon to 90,000 households. That's just in the city of Toronto alone. But Toronto housing crisis isn't about numbers, it's about people. People like Ariana, who is a young kid. Ariana and her family escaped the war in Ukraine with just two backpacks and two suitcases. Now in Toronto, Ariana and her family had to take three buses to get to the food bank in South Etobicoke. She's one of 18,000 kids that use the Toronto Daily Bread Food Bank every month to fill their belly. Now, Ariana is not fa a fan of those buses. She just said that it uh, takes so long. And they are using the food bank because like many kids in our fam in, and the families in Toronto, they need housing they can afford. We need to build. And so we're getting to work for Ariana to build more housing faster. Now, some of you might have heard that the city just passed the 2024 budget. It's hard to escape that you heard us did that. Yes, thank you, thank you. Now. Um, this budget meets the urgency of our housing crisis with the immediacy of our actions. It funds more development review staff on top of the 110 that we have hired last year. We're expediting the planning process for applications of all types, both affordable and market projects. You want to hear that, right? We've removed up to 200 days from the typical process from official plan amendment and zoning by law amendments. How about that? 200 days, okay? And yes, that is important. Yeah. Now, commenting timelines have been reduced to 14 days rather than months. 14 days just to circulate, okay? That is pretty good. It used to be months, years. 
Yeah, some of you are nodding. Okay, I'm sorry, I wasn't there yet. Uh, Commit of adjustment wait times are now down to 60 days, and there's more to come. As of right, uh, zoning for low-rise apartments and mid-rise development is on the way. The city has put in place as of right zoning to intensify neighborhoods with missing middle housing, garden suite, laneway suite, multiple multiplex dwellings. Zoning permission for tall and dense development is also in the works. But that's just the start. You want everything to be as of right rather right, than every site, right? The 2024 budget kickstart a generational transformation in how the city delivers housing. Funding 25,000 more rent control homes above what the city is already planning. We can't do it alone. The generational transformation needs everyone working together to make it happen. So we're bringing all of our city housing departments together to pull in the same direction with one focus, get housing built. Together with identify 52 sites and many others, we are not keeping, we're not showing you what those sites are yet. The 52 sites are the public ones across city divisions and agencies that are ready for housing. Ready for purpose-built rental buildings with thousands of affordable rent gear to income and rent control units. Ready now. The 2024 budget makes an historic 100 million investment over three years into the multi-unit residential acquisition program. Why? Because we're losing good housing, affordable housing, 14 times faster than we could build them. Through this expansion, this we call it MIRA program, affectionately called MIRA, uh, this expansion will enable thousands of tenants feeling insecure, facing evictions, rent increase, demo evictions, will have an opportunity to live in a secure, affordable, and rent-controlled home. This budget also makes huge investment, 100 million more in social housing, including funding for 1,300 new RGI units, which we haven't built for quite a while. And recently, we have worked with the provincial government and got $24 million in the federal government for, uh, for the provincial government for the, something called Canada Ontario Housing Benefits. And recently, we had an agreement and the federal government has transferred $20 million. What is this housing benefits? This housing benefit is really to that some people can't quite afford maybe t uh, their rent. They need an extra help, maybe 10%, 20% help, so they could actually rent the, the homes that they really need. So it takes people out of the shelter, and we spend far too much money on shelters. We have 11,000 people living in shelters, and they're expensive. So we're moving the people out of the shelters into permanent homes for this housing benefits. So that also helped. And speaking of federal government, the, the ink is drying in the federal budget. So let's make sure and work together that it is a transformational housing budget also. So right now, we engage in productive conversation with the federal government, the housing minister, and financial institutions on different funding models that through CMHC, that can unlock the potential and accelerate the building of housing in Toronto and elsewhere in Canada. That's what the city of Toronto need. That's what one in 10 people in this city who relies on the food bank need. That's what all the young people need, the seniors that are waiting for good housing need. We need supply, we need a lot more housing, we need some of those housing to be affordable. We have a plan, we have a team, 
we have a budget. All we need now is you. You, the builder. You actually built housing in the city. And you thought, they said, well, didn't you say, Mayor, during the election that you are going to do the building? No, 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 no. The city is not going to actually lay bricks. We're not actually doing the building. We're going to take some of the sites we own, and we're the develop developer. Okay, But we're going to partner with you, the builders or developers, to build together. So I need you to step up, folks in this room, because we're ready. We are ready to build the kind of housing the city of Toronto really need. The city, myself, and the Ontario Housing Minister, Paul Calandra, are having really productive conversations about building large housing projects along transit corridor. You've been saying, hey, if you're going to do the Ontario Line, LRTs, all of these transit corridors, why aren't we having high density in that area? I totally agree. We need to. We have to. But some of it also needs to be affordable, right? So it's mixed income housing. So we need your help to say that it's OK. Inclusionary zoning, small percentage, as long as the financial works, will actually get everybody in. I used to represent downtown Toronto when I was a city councillor for 14 years. If you look at city of Toronto downtown, no one can accuse me of being afraid of density. Why? I came from Hong Kong. I immigrated to Canada when I was 13. Have you seen Hong Kong residents or immigrants afraid of density? No. I'm not worried about density. I just want to make sure they are mixed income so that everyone could benefit into a community like St. Lawrence neighborhood. Look at all the high rise there. The condos, the nonprofits, the co-ops with the park and the community center and the swimming pools and the schools, everything into a complete neighborhood. That's what we need to do, especially around Transit Corridor. So I believe that we could do this together. Young people across the city, it's really hard. And we need to hire them. You know that the city of Toronto needs to hire a lot of people. Ambulance, fire, police, planners, you name it. We need to hire them. We have an aging population. We have an aging infrastructure, aging everything. We need to bring people in. But it's so expensive to live downtown. It's actually hard for the city of Toronto to hire people in because it's expensive. So we need to build housing so that our civil servants that actually deliver the service, there are 43,000 of them, that we all need, can actually live close by where they work. If not, they're going to all drive in, they're going to take go train or whatever. It's hard. So we need that for the young people. We need, we need them to give them hope because they can't wait. The folks who are currently freezing outside or sleeping in shelters, because our shelters are full, cannot wait. Ariana kids cannot wait, because a third of the people that are on the waiting list for affordable housing in the city are children. A third of them are seniors. They cannot wait. The wait right now is 13 years. There are some seniors that cannot wait 13 years, and they need housing. So let's get to work. Let's get housing back on track. Roll up our sleeve, build a city that's affordable, safe, caring, where everybody has a home, where everyone belongs. And that's my dream, and I'm sure that you share it too. Thank you so much for being here, and I look forward to the conversation. I'm going to get grilled by David Common. <laughs>
I can see it. I can see it because he was grilling me this morning on Metro Morning. I thought I wasn't ready at that time because I just woke up. And I, 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 I rushed down to Metro Morning. I couldn't put my two words together. I think I'm warmed up by now. Okay, so I'm ready. I'm ready. Thank you for being here. And thank you for your life of Swatcher. I'll lose my notes. You, you're going to lose your notes? Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to lose mine, and I'll tell you why. I am uh, not an expert at housing. I mean, the level of my expertise is that when I was going through university, I worked in uh, residential high-rise construction. And in the first couple of weeks, I got hit by some rebar from the crane, and the site super said, eh, David, you're getting out of the pit. And they put me out as the flag man on the street. Then I got hit by the cement truck. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, so this was, it was not their fault. It was, he just said, no workman's comp, uh, you know, just to take a day off, you're okay. So it all worked out, it all worked out. Thank you very much. And this started this career, this, uh, no. <laughs> well, yeah, it did in a way. It made me realize uh, residential high-rise construction was not the, the, the path for me in that case. Um, that's how you end up in journalism. You're bad at math and you can't build anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I heard you wanted to be a nurse. I did want to be a nurse, yes. That was my original plan. And then this tyrant named Peter Mansbridge came and spoke at my high school. Our high school, Our because high school. we both went to high school. I don't remember seeing you in the hallways at the time. I'm um, many years older than you are. Yes, okay. I'm sorry. It was Jarvis <laughs> Collegiate, just sort of up the road from where we are. Yeah. We had a different chant. Yeah, there we go. As did you. Richard As did Richard. also from yeah. there. So, any other Jarvisites in the room? Any chance? Whoa, Whoa look at that. Okay. Wow. Look at Jarvis, that. Yeah. Yes. All right, Jarvis represents. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's dig into it. And I'll just let you know the way that we're going to run things is I, I have a number of questions that the organizers have uh, given or armed me with. Um, I'll ask some of them, and then I want to get to your questions in the room uh, as quickly as we can. So we'll probably get to, to about 25 minutes of the questions that are on this clipboard and then move into your questions. I might move back to the clipboard, but the intent here is to get to your questions and there are two people with microphones in the room um, who will be able to do just that all right so starting off you talk about affordable housing you've talked about the the city as as builder um, do you see a difference between the city-led affordable housing projects and and the broader not-for-profit housing projects well the city have some financial resources because we have um, a big base. What the city is doing right now is signing memorandum of understanding with nonprofit organizations, uh, with cooperatives to say, go build, we'll back you up, here's the land, for example. Mm -hmm. And we also identified five sites where the city is going to build also. Like, we don't actually lay the bricks, mm -hmm. but we are the developer. Years ago, because I'm old, uh, the City of Toronto through Metro Toronto Housing Corporation and City Homes built 32,000 units of housing. George Cook, okay, I'm going a bit of history. That's the commissioner of housing at the time. And they are seniors homes, they are city homes, they are very successful and 100% of them are mixed income. Unlike the Ontario housing, which is all 100% subsidized, right? That's not a good model, mixed income. And when I was talking about um, the, uh, the Market Lane area, the David Crombie area, you know, down, down by the waterfront, St. Lawrence neighborhood, those were built around that time. They were cooperatives, nonprofits, all of those things. It's a perfect way. We've done it before. We stopped for 30 years because in the uh, mid-90s, everything stopped. At that time, the government had a different ideology and said, we're going to get out of the housing business and stop building. So CMXC went from a big developer helping everybody build, just stopped doing it. And as a result, you and I now see, and all of us see the housing crisis that's in front of us. High rent, 11,000 people living in shelters because the rent is so high. But let me jump in on you because you're talking about a time in the past, a, a, a time that, that has passed, the city 
does not have that capacity. These not-for-profits do not have the capacity to undertake development projects. How do they get that in short order? Perfect question. You're right, because the muscle memories are gone because it's a different generation. The good thing is there are some that are still left, and I see you. Some of you are still here that was developing before. There were lessons learned before. There were programs that worked really well. In fact, CMXG, those cooperatives, earned this uh, Canada an award in the habitat, and the award was uh, given over in Turkey and in Istanbul. So we used to win uh, through our cooperative movement. We won awards. There are some of the folks that are still there. So what we need to do is mentor the new generation. And many of you that are here that are eager to build, let us get together. And yes, we need to create something new because the market and everything is different. However, there, there are lessons we can learn on what we've done in the past. So let's learn from the past, create new, and let's do it together. Why do that instead of just continue with the model of private sector developers allocating affordable units? It hasn't happened. There are other tools, though, that you could use to, yes. to require it. Yes. So why go, why go with this, this dual model of having not-for-profits? Because in the, for 30 years, the private sector have been building homes, like in downtown Toronto, when I was a city council, when there was no housing program, lots of private developers, I'll use Concord Ajax over a city place, okay? Down by the waterfront by the city, okay? Lots and lots and lots of housing, which is great. Tall, big, condos. They're not necessarily affordable. So a wall of the buildings that are built in downtown Toronto are not necessarily affordable. They're condos, which is great. It's good for, for, for people that can afford to buy one. But if you can't, then what do you do? So why do you think we have a housing crisis? Mm -hmm. It's not just because the interest rate is high. When the interest rate was low, we had a housing crisis. It's just gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. Because if you look around the world, Government have always played a role. Whether it's Singapore, you're not talking about just ideology. It's common sense. Singapore, the government built. I came from Hong Kong. My father was a school superintendent, middle class, okay, earned a good living. We lived in government housing. Why? Well, in Hong Kong, the British government at the time, because it's a British colony at the time, there's all these refugees coming from China because the communist uh, regime was coming in. All these refugees was flooding from China to Hong Kong. And there's a big population boom. And then where do they live? It's a problem. So the Hong Kong government decided to build, 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 build. And it's not necessarily subsidized. It's for people of all income, you pay in, you get the equity, it's different model. It's home ownership, but it's government housing, and it created the middle class because people now have money left at the end of the month to buy and shop and eat out. And it worked quite well. And to this day, the Hong Kong Housing Authority is still very active in both building and maintaining housing. I imagine there'll be questions from the room on this particular subject line, so I'm going to move on at this point to demovictions and displacement. Um, we're in a period, you talk about intensification. How do you protect people who are being displaced along the way? Well, I talked about something called MIRA, which is the multi-res uh, acquisition program. Uh, in the budget, it, the, the program started with 10 million, mm -hmm. and it went to 20, 24 million. And in this budget, we put in 100 million. So the total amount of this program is 100 million. What does this do? It allows the city to assist the tenants to actually purchase the building. So let's say, I'll give you an example. There's a building in Keel Street where the residents were facing uh, eviction. They are now protected because through Wickham, which is a housing nonprofit provider, they purchase the building. And the pride that these tenants have are just amazing because now they're going to be secure forever. It's land trusts 
or cooperatives. So we are protecting some of the existing affordable housing through this program. Now we need to build new ones, a lot of them, but since we're losing it 14 times faster than we can build them, we need to protect the existing ones also. Land trust and cooperatives will only get you so far though. How do you That's protect right. the rest of them? Well, uh, we have different programs. We have a rent bank. We have eviction prevention. It's something called EPIC. Event, it's very EPIC program. Uh, eviction prevention uh, initiatives in, in communities. And it provides, because some of the tenants have mental health issues, for example. They're hoardings or they're not taking good care of their place. So we are helping to keep them there by getting social workers to support them so they don't become homeless. Or if they are a bit short, we can provide a bit of money for them so that they don't get evicted. Because once they get evicted, they come to our shelter. It's a lot more expensive for us to house them. So we much rather help them not get evicted and stay in their place. Would and you... it's better for the landlord too. Because How's that? Uh, well, because if you if there is a bit of bridging, then you don't have to evict the tenant, and then go through the process of because sometimes evicting some of the tenants might take a long a while, and you the person will then have continuity living there with some support from the city. You're talking a small amount, not not a big amount. Yeah, you're and you're talking about a carrot solution there. Would you use a stick like the interim control bylaw powers to temporarily suspend demo evictions? That's a bit drastic. I know some municipalities have done that. I'm not sure we are going to go there. Uh, we could consider it. What we have done is we have uh, provided some funding in a program called Rent Safe which helps if the landlord, and it, this doesn't happen all the time, but some landlords are not fixing uh, the heat or, or you know, there's crop, you know, it's falling apart. We have then bylaw enforcement officer to push them into fixing it, fixing the building. And if they don't, we then find them, we fix it and then, uh, and then charge them through the property tax. So it's a way of protecting the tenants. I, we find that has been very successful for us to do that. Can we talk about the yellow belt, belt the, the missing middle? Uh, more than a year ago, a year ago, the city reformed the zoning laws to allow the building of multiplexes. You were speaking about this in residential neighborhoods. Um, so far though, we're not seeing any intensification within that yellow belt. Do you see the need for other reforms or yes. system level changes. Go on. What do you see? Yeah. Uh, someone that owned a home may not have the financial means to do a basement apartment retrofit. They could rent it out afterwards and get some money. It's, it's a great thing, right? Especially a senior that are house rich, cash poor. So we're looking at some kind of financial support for them so that pay back of course but allow them to do the renovating the retrofitting the building of the laneway housing and all of that that's one way which is financial the second is making it easy not everybody knows now this is now as of right you don't have to go through committee of adjustment you don't have to need a planner but you might need an architect Ooh, how do you do that um okay so if we could figure out a bunch of models. So if you want this model, that model, then they could just, for, for someone that are not familiar in how to do that, you don't need a planner, an architect, and, and then you can just go and say, okay, I think I like this model or that model, then they could just go ahead and get it. So we want to simplify the process, making it easier and uh, so that they can both financially and, uh, <laughs> mental mental headspace because it's intimidating some people just don't know how to do it especially if you can't speak english very well right and your children are too too busy to mm -hmm. help you right so there needs to be good partnership good models to make it a lot simpler for people to do the four story four units those kind of to to make it 
to really kickstart a big bu building boom in the city of Toronto. Yeah, and so let's talk about those larger developments. Would you consider rezoning select parts of the Yellow Belt to allow mid to high rise development? Uh, yes. We are multi-tenant homes. We are trying to make sure they are permitted in all neighborhoods. They're coming into effect on May 31st this year. In terms of the big high rise, I was starting to talk about it, uh, especially in transit corridor. And I believe that we have a, um, uh, we're examining it. I think it is almost there. You will see it in front of city council quite soon. Do you see a role for incentives for developers? particularly for low to mid-rise? Well, the city of Toronto have something called the Open Door Program. The Open Door Program, actually, I, was just, I did a ribbon cutting recently in the Open Door Program where uh, the city of Toronto provide exemption, development fees, property taxes, uh, park levies, you name it, right? So all of the money that is required to, that they have to pay to the city of Toronto, we exempt them all in exchange for some of the units being affordable. Yes, absolutely. Because we could provide that in, in the project that I was just talking about. Also, we provided a grant to help, a, in this case, a nonprofit organization a developer, mm -hmm. to build housing. Can I talk just about your own internal organization? You have a vacancy for a city planner. Yes. What are you looking for? Well, I could, one of you might be in here. I, we're just hiring. Someone that could make decisions fast. So, yes. <laughs> have the courage to actually say yes or no. And there's a bunch that could just quickly say yes. There are some that are not so good, no. And then there's mostly in the middle, then let's put a timing timeline on it. I'm a firm believer of accountability through transparency. If we could tell people, when you come in, you know, you can tell which project, where it's at, then people will say, why am I waiting this long? What's going on? Right now, if you don't know where you stand, then you can't plan ahead. So transparency is something that I want to see. Good communication is important. And ability to lead, we now have, a, because we just hired a huge number of planners, um, to really motivate people to see it as a mission to build and build and build and build it faster. But also creative and flexible enough that different kind of built forms Right? So that too is very important. I'd like to ask you about Create TO. Aha, uh -huh. yes. What is uh, its role in the future of social housing in particular in this city? Well, right now we have three agency. We have Create TO, we have the Toronto Community Housing that mostly maintain existing housing, and we have the Housing Secretariat. I thought, okay, that's confusing. Who's doing what? So why don't we actually have one person that could assist in pooling all three agencies together? Not that we change the structure, but at least we are putting, having all of them going through the same direction, which is why in late October, the city of Toronto have this blueprint, a master plan, on building 65,000 units of housing, okay? And uh, it was stunning. Our city staff put all of that together in two months, and they worked day and night, and I know some of you are here. They're probably still recovering the, from the work that they have to do, because I was pushing them. And this blueprint, this master plan, um, helped bring all three different units together. And now we have a deputy uh, minister, uh, not minister, deputy city manager, Jack Sharma, in charge of building. And it used to be that, you know, you would have the engineers and then the builders and the planners and then the legal, there's like all these departments you have to navigate. They are now all under one person, 
which makes it a lot easier for it for us to drive it. Which is why you heard me talking about how much faster right now is two weeks to circulate. You, that's a lot faster than what we had. And the, the, the numbers I was giving you, 200 uh, days in terms of approval process, etc. cetera. So um, we're able to do all that because it's now under one person. If I just zoom out for a moment, I want to talk to you about how we got to where we are. Um, we talk a lot about high interest rates now and how that has stifled development over the past couple of years. However, we, we went through absolute boom times, um, never before seen cheap money for a never before seen amount of time. Mm -hmm. How is it that we have found ourselves with the worst housing affordability crisis in the G7? How, how do you think that happened? came back to the question that, that I, when I answered it in saying that we did not have a national housing strategy. The, both the federal and the provincial government exited. We did not build housing. They walked away. And of all the countries that you just mentioned, the, the government was involved, is involved. When we, when we had, at that time in ideology, unfortunately, that exited the scene and stopped being a partner, that's why we have a housing crisis. Now, that's my perspective. Um, it's interesting. Even the housing minister today said the same. Um, this is the federal housing minister, Sean Fraser, said that, and he said all government. He mentioned is liberal, conservative government. It's not which government. It's not which party that when you exit the scene, we had a building boom, but it's not affordable for a whole lot of people. And, and it's, if you look at those people that are using the food bank, quite a lot of them are working. They have jobs, they have several shifts of jobs, not even one job, several jobs. They just can't afford to pay the rent. So it's not just about supply, supply, supply. That's, it is a problem because we're growing and we're not building enough. That is one problem. But during the time when we were building enough and the numbers of immigrants are not right, you know, it has not dramatically risen, we still had a housing problem at that time. So it's not just about supply, it's also about affordability. I wanna to get to questions uh, from the room in just a moment, but I will, and I have more questions if for some reason you don't have any, but uh, I, I did want to, I know that's not going to happen. can't believe that. I, um, I did want to wrap up with something you and I have talked about before, and it is about who you are as a person, and the people in this room come from, um, from different areas, but uh, you have done billion dollar deals with the Premier. Not that many months after he said you would be an unmitigated disaster if you became the mayor. So what do you want people to know about who you are? I'm practical. I'm impatient. Partially because I'm not young. I want to see things done. And I want to seek common ground. And I am a firm believer that no matter what ideology, no matter where, which party, people know that we need to build housing. They know that we have to make life affordable. It's how to get there, that is the question. But the how can be negotiated, can be discussed, right? And... Are you looking to do deals? 100%. 100%. I did that all the time. Back in the days when there's Section 37, people know what Section 37 is, right? Some of you, okay. So if you want, let's say David, you, ha you want to build a building th uh, this tall. So far the city, uh, up to your banner. The city is saying that you can only build, you know, up to that building. But you want to go a bit, a lot further. Uh, well. At, well, let's say 10%, um, 20% further. I looked around, okay, well, you know, it's okay if it's 10 or 20%. I'll give you an example, because one of you I worked with, um, Daniels that was, um, right at the corner of King and John Street. Daniels want to build 
that building. I said, okay, uh, all right. TIFF Lightbox also needs some money. We need some Section 37 money. Okay, why don't you provide some funding for TIFF Lightbox so they could build the TIFF Lightbox and you can get higher density and build higher. Fine, okay, everybody got, the Daniel's got more building, more uh, higher density, make a bit more money. And in turn, they invested in helping build the TIFF light box. I did that with Concord Adex, I did that with Tridel. I, you know, uh, if you look at downtown Toronto, the child care centers, the parks, the community centers, the libraries, um, any number of the parks, and they, all of that is through working with the developer to say that you need a complete neighborhood. If it is just about building, it's not enough. It's you need places where people can gather. You need complete neighborhoods. You need places where kids can play. You need green space. So uh, yes, I can make deals. Let's get to the tough questions now. All right, there are, there's one microphone there and there's a second microphone there. So we can do this just old fashioned like we did at Jarvis Collegiate. You put your hand up. If you got a question, someone with a mic will come over to you and we'll come to you. Whoa, no one with a question? Oh, there's one, yep. Hey everyone, my name is Luke Anderson. I'm with the Accelerating Accessibility Coalition. Has anybody heard about the coalition yet? Yeah. yeah. All right, <clears throat> great interview. There was a word missing in it. Accessible. Yeah, so a complete community to me and all the members, 45, many are in this room, are all keen on creating an accessible community, accessible homes that work for, for everyone, whether that's a family member who might have a disability that's visiting another family in their home, making sure that their home is accessible. An aging population that's needing accessibility. We want to be working with everybody in this room collectively, whether it's private developers or not-for-profit developers as well, community organizations, all collaborating, learning from each other, and really bringing this conversation to a new level so that we get ourselves out of maybe some fear of not knowing about what this is all about, what accessibility means. I think there's an underlying fear around disability, not knowing how to build spaces that work for, for everyone. So I'm call to action is to start leaning into those fears a little bit and, and um, getting this conversation up on the podium and that word accessibility to a, a new uh, level of, of um, well, debate, topic of campaign uh, platforms needs to happen. I totally agree. Thank you very much. Did you want to add to anything to that? It, that's you... it's smart development because, as you said, aging population or, you know, it's again the, about flexibility. And whether it's about climate change, accessibility, all of those things are critically important. Right, and it's not seen as, it's not extra, it's essential. That's all, there was a question there, yeah. Um, I'm here today with a bunch of our students from the U of T School of Cities, um, and I, I'll ask you the same question that I asked the other day of the federal housing minister in another ULI event. Um, right now, there's a public meeting going on about a, a transit-oriented community along the Ontario line. Um, and the city doesn't really have much leverage with the province on the Ontario line or on any of these transit-oriented community sites. How are you working with the other levels of government, Minister Calandra, Minister Fraser, to ensure that a strong percentage of affordable housing is included in the 
thousand units of housing that the province has identified along the Ontario line. There's active conversation about higher density. The city can approve those density. I have no problem approving those density immediately. But I want to make sure that there is inclusionary zoning allowed, meaning that the city, if you are building 35 stories, et cetera, that I want 10, 20, or 30%, depending on the bill form, depending on the financials, that are affordable. And it's not just about 80% market, because that's not enough. It needs to range to 30, but, well, rent gear to income, when I talk about rent, uh, RGI units, is 30% of the income, okay? So perhaps 10% of rent gear to income and more percentage, you know, 10, 20, 30% of, it depends against the financing, of market that is, could be X percentage, there needs to be a range. So it needs to be mixed income. Because in the past, if we just define affordability as 80% market, there's still a whole whack of people that can afford it. That 80,000 to 90,000 people of household that are on the waiting list for the City of Toronto RGI units can afford 80% market, right? So what we need to do is, I, I'm actively saying to the provincial government, I have no problem in immediately saying much higher density along those lines. But I need inclusionary zoning. And I need you, all of you, to say mixed income housing is fine. Okay? We won't be unreasonable because if it's if it is too the, the the subsidy is too much or the income level is too low, then you can't finance it. Right? So it, it needs the financing needs to have to be uh, to work. But we can do that. We can fast track it. We can give higher density, but we need some percentage of it to be affordable. Do you have any over there, Alex? Any questions over there? Anyone else? How about? Uh, There's a question. Two okay. questions at the back of the room. There. You're warming up. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Scott Hello. Figler, JLL. Thank you for the conversation and the speech. Just to play devil's advocate, Montreal has the 2020 rule, and the vast majority of new housing development, <laughs> excuse me, is going North Shore or South Shore. So developers are not building as much in the city in response to that. Do you have any thoughts on, on that and maybe unintended consequences of <clears throat> inclusionary zoning policy? Uh, true, which is why I keep talking about financials, right? Um, London, it worked. The mayor in London have inclusionary zoning, and people have much higher density and much faster approval. So it depends on how you do it. It depends on the percentage, it depends on how fast, and what kind of density. The, sorry, just... London, England, or London, Ontario? Just England, to... sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, no, 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 okay. not London, Ontario. I'm sorry. Thanks. Because I think there's two buildings oh, sorry, under construction in Ontario. Me. Yes, I should, should not make that assumption. <laughs> that answer your question? Yeah. Was there another one? Because, in the room? I, oh. you know, higher density means more units. It makes your financial works a lot better. You can sell more, right? You're just using that piece of land. And speed means money. Right, so there are incentives that we could provide that could make it work. My name is Cole Starkman from the Schulich School of Business. 
How do you plan on presenting affordable housing and inclusionary zoning to private developers in a positive way so that it isn't coming straight out of their pocket and that they aren't reluctant to build more affordable housing? I've seen it work before. And um, I'll give you the example of Section 37, right? And developers are willing to build uh, I'll use Concord ADEX again, <laughs> uh, city homes. Uh, sorry, city place. Um, they're willing to to build um, parks, two linear parks, a community center, a library, etc., because they have higher density, right? So uh, it really is what is your bottom line? As long as you can, your return is a, it is a good return, why fear it? Mixed income housing, if you, again, I go back to St. Lawrence neighborhood, the, uh, the Bathurst Key neighborhood, a lot of the downtown area near Art Gallery of Ontario, there are a lot of city homes in that neighborhood, on McCall Street, all of that is mixed income housing. A lot of the money to build this mixed income housing, some of it's come from developers. I can name a building, 633, uh, Lickshore, um, that building is a co-op. That money came from the development of uh, Schocher, one of the banks, Bank Tal, because they were allowed to have a higher density and they contributed an X dollar amount and that money went to build the co-op. So it has worked before, I've seen it work, I've done that kind of deals. and. As long as financially is still profitable for developers to do it, we could work together because it served the city goal of providing affordable housing, but it also served the developer's goal of uh, having healthy returns while you can sell the units or rent the units out. Yep, question there. So there and then there. Yep. Hi, have you had... Sorry. Yeah, you go ahead, sir. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Andrew Franchick. Have you had any conversations with the Ford government about when they're going to be approving the major transit station areas that the city approved about two years ago? <laughs> well, we unlocked one. I think we just did one just before the holidays, and there's a list of them. They, the two-year uh, jam started... Um, being uh, the logjam is broken. It, 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 it's, it's, we are in active conversation. That's why you saw the first one. That was like eight, uh, thousands of units. That first one just got approved. That has been hanging around for two years. We've been waiting for them to say yes. And we've been waiting. They've been waiting. Finally, he said, well, come on. Let's do this. So. That got done, that was one of the biggest ones. And then there's a whole more, like, you know, there's another long list of them. We're actively talking about them. Answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, I know the, exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, okay, you have a question there, and the mic can go to this woman right here, and then I see you, sir, in the back. Yeah, please. Good afternoon, Mer Chow, or sorry, rather, good evening, Mer Chow. Uh, my name there is Nicholas, go. and my pronouns are they and them. Um, so I'm grateful for the discussion tonight, uh, particularly around how we can prevent people who are currently precariously housed from becoming unhoused. But I think a word that was missing in tonight's conversation was for those people who actually do not currently have shelter. And so there are many people tonight in the sub-zero weather who are taking shelter in Toronto's ravines, mm -hmm. parks, and yeah. on the streets. Meanwhile, up in Willowdale, where I live, there is a modular housing development oh, which yes. has finally Humber. been approved at the OLT, except it's not because it's being reviewed, oh. where for some odd reason, the provincial government has not issued an MZO and we have upwards of 60 units where you could have people who are currently in encampments instead of living in modular housing. So my question is, as mayor, what strategies do you propose to fast track modular housing and other forms of uh, rapid housing to get people off the streets and living in dignified, affordable homes? Thank you. Uh, we're doing a lot of things as of right. 
we're saying to some of our staff that they have, we give them the power to approve, meaning it doesn't have to come through community council, which helps. Some of those projects can come directly to the housing committee, so it's not necessarily local. That helps. And then when there's log jams, I meet with the housing secretariat staff and the person I was talking about, Jack Sharma, that oversee all the housing, even though they're different, three different units, right? And then they are all corporations that belong to the city, ultimately. I meet with him and his staff team every two weeks. And we have a dashboard of all the development projects, including you know, all of those. Which one are getting stuck? How do we unstuck them? <laughs> Which one are being fast-tracked? Okay. So every two weeks, we go through this dashboard with all the development projects, including what you're talking about. Plus, we have, during that roadmap that we approved, it's a, I, I invite you to take a look at that roadmap or your blueprint, whatever you want to call it, is, uh, is transformational in my mind because it, it lists all the things we're going to do. It lists all the recommendations, and each of the recommendations, I, uh, we review them to see when is it coming back, what's the status update of each of them, because I come from a, that if you cannot measure the goals, then you don't know whether you are successful. If I can't measure that I have 60 people out of shelters and into some kind of modular housing, then I am not successful. How long has it been waiting? In that one, it's tragic how long that has been waiting. Now, I talked about the rent subsidy, like through the housing benefit, that's immediately moved over 3,000 people off from shelters into homes. We are doing a lot more on that. We are doing uh, modular housing. We just approved a capital budget that could build more shelters because yes, you're right. There are people sleeping on ravines and parks and all that. We could evict them, close the encampment, but then we don't have room in the shelter. right? So we can't do that until we have room in the shelter. Right now, tonight, all the warming centers are open. All the uh, respite centers are open because the, the shelters are full and you can't sleep out. Well, some do, but it's very difficult. So we're doing our best. And uh, the, the wonderful thing is this. Both the provincial conservative government, the Ford government, and the federal liberal government both understand the needs for shelter and housing. Both of these two governments have stepped up and say, we will help. That's worthy of celebration. So yes, there are small problems along the way. There's negotiation. But there's no debate that we need support from other levels of government. And they're stepping up, which is very encouraging. Thanks very much. Question there? Hi, Maya Chow. My name is Victoria. And I'm one of the participants for this year's Curtain Leadership Program. And uh, this year, the topic is how the city to build aff more affordable housing. And we think fabric homes, fabric homes could be a quite good solution to accelerate the construction process. Currently, the, our city has only 1,000 licenses for the prefabric homes. Any, uh, do you have any solutions or suggestions how we are going to celebrate, ce uh, celebrate this process and bring more fa pre fabric homes to our city? Rapid homes through the Rapid Housing Initiative, which, um, which, which, which program? Uh, we have 1,000 units for the affordable uh, social housings for pre fabric homes. Okay, so I, let me see if I got your question. Uh, the federal government have a rapid housing initiatives, right? The rapid housing initiative went through three rounds and there's not enough money in there. 
As a result, there are a lot of organizations like Good Shepherd, for example, that raise private dollars, $6 million. They are ready to build, they got the land, they're ready, the board is ready, they got money, but they don't, they did not get in rapid housing initiative. So I'm hoping the federal government in the upcoming budget would renew that program so that those rapid housing initiatives applications like Good Shepherd would actually get the funding. Okay, um, what we've noticed is that the provincial government, the 2023 target, um, we Toronto exceeded that target by 146 percent. So they have something called building faster housing. And we have now, uh, our target is 30,000 housing starts. So we're doing quite well. And every week I'm doing yet another ribbon cutting or something, right? So uh, it, it is working. So um, does that answer your questions about the rapid housing initiative? Yeah. Okay. So. Anything um, we can do as a city of Toronto? Uh, we support those rapid housing initiative applications, and uh, a lot of them we partner with the federal government, so they would give some of the grants. Sometimes we then cancel the lot levy, any number of property tax through the open homes program, so that we could provide financial incentive to help build, right? So. Thank you. Development charges, lot levies, park levies, um, property tax, et cetera. Thanks very much. Um, I'm gonna, I see two more questions on that side of the room and I think we'll wrap up. Okay, you have a third one. You have to go very quickly. We'll do one there. One here, um, two over here. Okay. One question there, yeah. Samir Chow, very quickly. Um, <clears throat> You spoke a lot about affordable housing and mixed-use communities, and I'm a big believer in both. I think they're absolutely required, and uh, we haven't been delivering enough. But question and a comment, I guess. The comment is I would urge you to focus on market rate housing. Affordable housing on its own is only going to be delivered in a very limited quantity. And on the market side, we are seeing challenges. So when you're thinking about your financial feasibility, my question is how much thought are you actually lending to the market component? We as developers are struggling to burden the 70, 80, 90% of the market with the additional costs associated with delivering affordable housing. It's not solely solvable by more floors. It's not enough. I can tell you it's not enough. So as you're working through the solution, I urge you to think of a market solution as well as an affordable solution. I totally agree, which is why when I spoke uh, earlier on, um, the number one complaint that I, or uh, problem that developers face in the city is slow, very, the development process that, that takes forever, that there are uh, policies that sometimes doesn't make sense. So, uh, I did talk about removing 200 days from the typical process for official plan amendment, OPA. Uh, we are, um, we are eliminating, removing preliminary reports and we are doing earlier community consultation meetings. We have reduced, as I said, 14 days to circulate rather than weeks and months. One site plan rather than five. <laughs> Etc. cetera, um, because that actually saves you money. We have a pilot project in Toronto, East York, North, with specialized team, so to quickly approve condominium registration. We're about to roll it out citywide, because often I said, well, we can't even get registered, everything is ready, well, just give us the approval. And we're doing that right now, to quickly approve the, the condo registration, and you're gonna see it all across the city. Uh, as I said, C of A is now reduced to under 60 days, right? So there are more that we can do. And this is all within the last few months. If I, and and the that. timing is absolutely appreciated. And it's definitely, time is money. It's definitely not lost on us. I would urge you maybe to say um, a suggestion or an idea. 
we have foregone the HST on rental projects. Yes. Can we forego the HST on market housing? That would bring down the cost of market housing right away to eight, nine, 10, up to 13% lower in some cases, and allow these projects to move forward at a price that actually makes sense today without costing the municipality anything. It's a concession, obviously, on the feds. And uh, I would like you to invite the Minister of Housing <laughs> and Minister of Finance, Christia Freeland, right here, because she does have to say yes, because remember how long you asked for uh, the GST and HST cancellation? Right, you've asked for years, and finally it was a yes late fall, and then the provincial government said, "Well, we will do that too." Right, the feds go, and then the province will go. Uh, I unfortunately don't get any of the GST and HST. Wouldn't like wouldn't mind getting a share of it, but we don't have it. Um, that's another topic. So, y yes, it, you know, check with her. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'll go to the back of the room there. Oh, where? There? Okay, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Mark. Um, I'm probably one of those people Olivia was referring to earlier as that old, older group of people that were around back uh, when Olivia was a counselor. And we were building, the development industry was building tens of thousands of units of affordable housing, I mean, all over Canada. Can you put uh, the mic closer to your mouth? Uh, they were building, you know, the development industry was building tens of thousands of units. At that time, I was with uh, Neil over at the Daniels Group, and, and we were, you know, churning out affordable housing. Now, the ingredients that allowed us to do that are, aren't in place anymore. We were living in a, it was a, a perfect storm that allowed the developers like Daniels, who chose to, to jump into that, that portfolio, uh, along with a number of other companies in the room. Um, you know, there was a, a vibrant CMHC that were, that were interested in housing. There was a very strong provincial housing program. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, all of these ingredients, along with uh, a, a robust uh, sector within the city of Toronto that were keen on building nonprofit and affordable housing and co-ops. There was hundreds and hundreds of uh, consultants uh, pushing nonprofit groups to make them successful. None of these ingredients, very few of them still exist. And so my question is how, given the desire and need to do all the housing that we're talking about without those ingredients, in spite of all the efforts that you and, and other levels of government are now trying to make, what, what, what could we do to go, I don't wanna go back to those times, I think you know, there, were, there were positive aspects and negative, but we're now lumbered with even a bigger problem and none of the real ingredients that we need to to, to, to make that, to solve that problem. And you know, is there something, is there, there's no magic bullet, but is there something that we're missing that we could collectively? It's called political will, Mark. Yeah. It's coming back. Come on, look at it. Look, it's coming back. We see it. No, it's not perfect, but we could have new ingredients. It doesn't have to be the old ingredients. We could create new ones. There are a lot of people here that have the smarts to do it. And it doesn't have to be all about nonprofits. It's not all about cooperatives. It's a lot of folks that have new ideas. We've done it before. It was just because the political will wasn't there for quite a while, but we are seeing it back. Right? So I urge you not to give up. Just because it hadn't been around for two or three decades, it doesn't mean that there's no political will anymore. I'm sensing that there is. And I am sensing that we could do it. We could. Now, is it enough at this point? Absolutely not. You're right. The dollar doesn't work. Doesn't work. But it doesn't mean that we cannot create it. There's enough smarts and creativity in this room to do so. Uh, Mayor Chow, on this side. Um, so I appreciate your comments specifically about life experiences in high density areas where you grew up. And I think that's really a, a part of the factor and the key to success in Toronto. And I feel like 
I look around the city all the time and I see missed opportunities. Mm -hmm. I drive down Eglinton and I see some of the most beautiful transit stations I've ever seen. But, I there's, know. but there's nothing on top of them. I know, I know. And I look and at libraries I, on beautiful sites that, as a developer, I would build you a new library. Oh, and we I, could build and a school and a yes. library and a firehouse and an ambulance and a, and I don't want to make the same mistakes going forward. So how do we ensure we don't miss those opportunities do, upcoming? Do not lose faith because remember I talked about the blueprint. You will see because the city of Toronto identified every site through CreateTO. Libraries, community centers, every department, board, agencies, except the police at this point. Fire, <laughs> ambulance, no, I'm serious, libraries, all boards and directors, and we just started a, um, the school board have now joined with the city of Toronto. I created a committee that brings all the different school boards, Catholic, public, all coming together because I want to look at their sites. They are sitting on really good land that we could help develop. So is the TCHC, the Toronto uh, Community Housing. We have land. We can use the equity that they have and build for-profit market housing. It shouldn't just be RCI, RGI units because there are some areas, there are too many RGI units, right? So if you look at Regent Park, we redeveloped that whole area, thank you, Daniels. Uh, but we were able, and Tridel did it, Alexander Park. We were able to do that. There was no shooting last year, no death, no gun violence. Why? Mixed income housing. We know how to do it, absolutely. And there are empty sites all over the place. There's lots of opportunity. So TCH has a new CAO. His mandate is to build housing not just RGI housing, market housing, so that they could achieve mixed income housing in some of the area that only have RGI units. So keep looking at those sites and say, aha, we can do something there. Go and talk with our uh, housing secretariat. I'll guarantee you that site is on our big master list. As I said, we have identified 50, 60, but we identified all of them. Some of them we don't make public, as I said, right? Because of, you know, obvious reasons. Um, so, but we absolutely could do partnership because we want to build. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you. Um, I know we didn't get to all of the questions. There's the one at the back of the room. I will hold the mayor here. You want to run up here and you can ask after all Thank of this you. is done. Uh, you're the hook man to shut us down, I'm assuming. Yeah. Right, yeah. So thank you. Thank you to David and to Mayor Chow and to the audience for such a, a lively uh, and passionate evening of discussion here. My name's Tobias, and uh, I'm here on behalf of, of Tricon Residential. Uh, and I'm also co chair of the ULI program committee uh, that helped organize this event uh, along with uh, ULI staff and, and many others. And so it's my pleasure to close out the, the evening here. And so, in addition to our esteemed speakers, I want to once again thank tonight's uh, event sponsors, Manaby Homes, Tricon Residential, Atrium Mortgage Investment Corporation, the Carpenters Union, Civic Developments, and Windmill. Let's have a round of applause for everyone. And so as our chair, uh, Michelle Ackerman, spoke to earlier in the evening, I want to remind everyone again of the third annual ESG Symposium coming up on uh, March 1st with RBC, uh, consistent with the main theme of this evening's program, which is the challenges facing us in the housing industry today. Um, we all know that the, the current macroeconomic environment makes it difficult and challenging to, to make the math pencil on uh, development, but challenging as it may be, there's a, a dedicated group of developers and industry professionals that are really leaning into social and environmental obligations that we as an industry must champion and how these leaders are advancing ESG is precisely the focus of this symposium. So we hope you can join us for what promises to be both an educational and fun afternoon at uh, RBC's Waterfront Place on Queen's Quay. So once again, thank you to our sponsors of the evening. Uh, and with that, on behalf of the University of Toronto School of Cities, ULI Toronto, and our media partner, CBC, I wish you all a great evening and safe uh, travels home tonight in the snow. <laughs>